All right, gang, welcome to our next lecture that is going to be on Chapter 10, Stress, Well-Being, and Violence at Work. By the end of today's lecture, you should be able to trace the history of the study of stress in organizations. You should be able to define the term stressor and describe several categories of stressors. Then I'd like for you to be able to describe the psychological, physiological, and behavioral consequences of stress. Then we're going to talk about three different theories of stress, including Karasik's job demand control model, um, person environment, per, the person environment fit model, as well as a number of individual differences in um, stress. Then I'd like for you to be able to explain the differences between primary, secondary, and tertiary stress prevention strategies. Then we'll talk, take a look at some, some characteristics of the typical violent worker when we talk about violence in the workplace. And finally, we'll discuss two theories of workplace violence. Let's begin with an interesting quote that kind of sums up the way I sometimes feel about stress. Um, this comes from thinkexist.com, and i um, not sure exactly who the author is, but it says, Stress, the confusion created when one's mind overrides the body's basic desire to choke the living daylights out of some jerk who really deserves it. Studying stress in organizations is an important topic. We know this because stress has a number of important consequences, such as lawsuits, illness, psychological well-being, or negative psychological well-being, as well as counterproductive work behavior. So a lot of bad things can occur from stress. So today we're going to, call, we're going to focus on the causes of stress, as well as the health consequences of stressors, and strategies to overcome stress within an organizational environment. Let's first take a look at some of the history with a study of stress. All of these researchers are pretty seminal in this area and we'll focus on each one of these one at a time. Let's start with um, Cannon. In 1929, Cannon was the first um, person to basically term the fight or flight reaction for stress. Um, and he was also the first to use the term stress. Um, and it's interesting because this dates all the way back into the 20s. So we were studying stress at a very early time. This is a funny cartoon that speaks to the whole fight or flight response. There's a little bird on a therapist's seat and it says, it was a classic fight or flight response. Next time, try flight. Moving on, Hans Selye is considered the father of stress, and he defines stress as non -specific, a nonspecific response of the human body to any demand made on it. He also distinguished between the terms eustress and distress. Distress is what we commonly view as stress, the negative stressors. Eustress, on the other hand, refers to the positive stressors that occur in our lives. For example, these might be things such as the birth of a baby, a wedding, or the upcoming holidays. This slide provides a general overview of the differences between Canyon, Cannon and Selye's work. The older Cannon's work focused much more, as you can see on the left-hand side, on acute stressors that were physiological in nature, while Selye focused much more on the chronic, everyday stressors that are psychological in nature that we tend to see today. Another funny cartoon. It says that my doctor told me that if you don't reduce the job stress here, I could be dead in six months. Well, that's a relief, the boss says. Excuse me, you can train your replacement in less than three months. Ha ha. In the 1990s, along came a gentleman, um, a researcher by the name of Lazarus, who told us that it's not enough to focus on what stressors exist or the physiological consequences, but in addition, we need to focus on how people perceive their environments as well as how they cope with these stressors. In addition, he identified two major types of coping. There's problem-focused coping and emotion-focused coping. Problem-focused coping focuses on the individual tackling the problem that directly is at hand, while emotion-focused coping focuses on the individual who takes an emotional reaction to dealing with stress. Um, so, for example, let's say that someone is experiencing some economic difficulties. Maybe they've lost their job. Problem-focused coping would look like this. The person might actually get out the want ads and just directly try to um, find a job and just 
really focus on anything they can to deal with the problem. An emotion-focused coper, on the other hand, instead of tackling the problem, is going to talk with others about how bad they feel. They might um, get very emotional and, and um, want to um, cry and break down. So it's a very different way of coping. Finally, there is con and biozaire. Uh, or Biosier, I'm not sure exactly how you say that. Um, they came up with a pretty complicated model that looks at um, a number of aspects with regard to the whole um, stress s stress um, study. And what they basically said was this in a nutshell. They basically said, look, there's a lot of stressors in the workplace, as you can see here on the left-hand side, such as physical and, and psychosocial stressors. Um, then they said that these stressors can lead to a number of bad consequences, whether they're physiological, psychological, and or behavioral. And they, they emphasize the importance of our perceptions. And they said that our, our perceptions influence how we will interpret and respond to stressors. And finally, they said that aspects of our personality and the situation will also influence our perception as well as our response to stressors. So while it looks like a complicated model, it's not too bad when you put it all together. So what are stressors? You can think of stressors as simply physical or psychological demands to which an individual responds. And there are a number of things that are examples of stressors. Take a look. So all of these things that you see outlined here, heat, cold, noise, interpersonal conflict, work pace, time pressures, perceived control, um, what we call emotional labor that we'll talk about soon, situational constraints, role stressors, and work schedule are all things that are either physical or psychological demands that a, a person in an organization must respond to. In general, however, you can group stressors into two different categories or types. These are physical or task stressors and psychological stressors. Let's begin by talking about um, physical stressors and specifically let's take a look at noise. Um, a lot of us tend to think of noise as being a stressor when we think of people who work in jobs like um, in the factories. But what we want you to know here that's important as IO psychologists is that even low no low levels of noise is an issue too. Um, there's a little clip here at the at the bottom and we will post this for you to see um, and it actually was just um, out not too long ago. Um, I saw it um, just a little while ago and it really is just an interesting um, little clip on the influence of noise in our lives today. Another funny cartoon, it says pop radio syndrome and the doctor's talking to some hairy guy and says your eardrums have repetitive stress injury. Let's move on and talk about task stressors. Task st stressors include all of the things um, that involve our tasks that can be stressful. And these are, um, for example, how fast we have to work, um, the amount of work that we have, as well as just the cumulative number of hours that we work. Um, one note that I would like to make on physical and task stressors is that one type of stressor um, is not made less important um, with the presence of another stressor. What that means is if you're dealing with a heavy workload and you have um, um, a, a heavy pace of work and you have to work a number of hours, um, these things are cumulative. So they're going to have a very negative effect. They build up on you over time. Let's move on and talk about psychological stressors at work. These include lack of control or predictability, interpersonal conflict, role stressors, work family conflict, and emotional labor. Let's start by taking a look at lack of control and predictability. Control refers to an individual's perception um, of predictability in response to a person or to a situation. You can think of this as related to autonomy, um, which is the extent to which employees can control how and when they perform the tasks of their job. Um, ways that we can address this issue are to provide employees um, greater perceptions that they have control. And we can do this by basically giving them more control in the forms of, for example, participative decision making, allowing them to help make decisions, as well as providing them opportunities to develop their own t time schedules or flex, flex time. Um, so in other words, give them a little bit more control if that's what they're needing. 
Interpersonal conflict is another important stressor. As many of us know, um, negative interactions with our coworkers and supervisors and clients um, can be very, very um, stressful. Um, and we are seeing this um, right now when resources are scarce, um, but we also see this when employees have incompatible interests. They just don't seem to see eye to eye or when employees feel that they're just simply not being treated fairly. Let's move on and talk about role stressors, um, which are another uh, important type of stressors in the organization. Researchers have identified three different types of role stressors. These are role ambiguity, conflict, and overload. Um, but to give you an idea of what role stressors are in general, just think of the fact that any job that you can think of has multiple requirements um, and multiple roles. And when these roles conflict with each other, it can lead to stress in the form of, again, either role ambiguity, role conflict, or role overload. Um, Role ambiguity is when employees lack clear knowledge of their expected behavior. So they're given a task and they're not quite sure um, what it is that they're supposed to do. That would be role ambiguity. Um, role conflict is when demands from different sources are incompatible. Let me give you an example from my own life. One of um, the aspects of my job requires me to be an administrator. Um, and that is when I'm, asked, when I'm asked to act as an administrator, that leads me to spend less time with students. Another part of my job asks me to spend time with students when I teach. Um, and unfortunately, these two roles, the administrative side as well as the teaching side, are um, in conflict with each other. Um, and it can be very stressful. And finally, role overload is when an employee is, is expected to fill too many roles at once. And so um, I also have a good example of this at my own college. Um, I'm involved as a faculty member as and as an administrator, but also um, I'm in charge of a few other areas of the college, and this leads to too many roles for me to fulfill. One very important topic um, in today's um, stress literature is the topic of work-family conflict. This occurs when workers experience conflicts between roles they fulfill at work and roles they fulfill in their personal lives. So, um, for example, being a mother and taking care of um, your children conflicts with my ability to um, work um, in the office. One of the things that we can do to help people who are experiencing high levels of work-family conflict is to be more flexible when it comes to their schedule so that they can incorporate both aspects of their personal lives and their work lives. Um, and of course today, child care is becoming increasingly important. So a number of organizations are offering child care um, as a benefit to their employees. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that work conflict is bad? There was actually a study by Lundberg and Frankenhauser in 1999 that answered this question or examined this. And what they found was in a study of high-ranking positions, um, these are white-collar positions, women reported more stress by their greater responsibility for household and family duties. So based upon this study, you might think that um, work-family conflict is indeed bad. But before we go there, there um, is actually other contrary research um, that um, we need to look at. So, for example, Cleveland, Stockdale, and Murphy found that there is little evidence to indicate that a woman's employment actually harms her marriage or her children. And also, Karabic and McDonald found that compared to men, women appear to have better coping strategies to handle stress. Interesting, eh? Another stressor that we deal with is called emotional labor. Um, this is a stressor that we commonly see in the service industry, and we talk, we'll talk about this soon. Emotional labor refers to the regulation of one's emotions to meet job or organizational demands. In other words, you work at a place where um, you have to basically perform, and your, your emotions have to be in check. Um, in general, research tells us, though, that employees deal with this need to be happy, if you would, in one of two ways. They can basically act, but there are two different ways that they can act, um, and um, it's interesting. Surface acting basically refers to faking one's expressions or emotions. Deep acting, on the other hand, is really trying to manage one's feelings, including their emotions um, required for the job. In other words, you're really, you're, you're going to that happy place and you're trying to convince yourself that you really are happy. Um, 
where do we deal with emotional labor? As I said, in the service industry, service industry primarily. So you see a lot of people who have to deal with emotional labor, um, who are wait staff, who are bill collectors, sales clerks, flight attendants, and police officers. Um, consequences and fixes. Um, there are some negative consequences if you are experiencing emotional labor. This leads to job dissatisfaction, burnout, turnover intentions. Um, what we can do to help people who are dealing with emotional labor is we can encourage them to use humor whenever possible so that they can actually go to that happy place where um, they're convincing themselves that they are um, happier. Um, we can encourage people who are dealing with this to obtain social support from friends and from others. Um, and then finally, we want to encourage employees to kind of depersonalize the encounters. In other words, you know, let people understand that this is just a job and when you leave, you're done. You don't have to deal with this customer forever. So what does stress lead to? Well, the simple answer is stress leads to a number of bad things. Let's talk about some of these bad things. In general, the bad stuff that we're talking about that stress can lead to um, are a number of psychological consequences, behavioral consequences, and physiological consequences. And these are organized as you see here. So physical consequences, as um, I just said, um, include a number of things um, such as uh, back pain, digestive problems, heart disease, increased blood pressure. Psychological um, consequences of stress are things such as burnout, anxiety, depression, uh, family problems, sleep problems, and job dissatisfaction. And then there are a number of behavioral consequences such as individuals, employees who um, either arrive to work late or are absent, drug and alcohol abuse, increased accidents, violence in the workplace that we'll talk about pretty soon, um, effects on decision making and cognitive processing, poorer performance, and um, finally turnover intentions of people who want to leave their jobs. In terms of behavioral consequences, one of the things that we know is that chronic stress really has some negative effects on our, our cognitive performance, our memory, our reaction time, our accuracy, and task performance. Um, and in terms of performance, it used to be um, people would believe that there was a inverted U relationship between performance and stress. And what they thought was that as arousal increased, performance increased, but only up to a certain point, and then performance would begin to decline. So they would think that basically a little bit of stress was good for us. So this is what they thought. So a little bit of stress right there in the middle would lead to high levels of performance, but either too low levels of stress or too high levels of stress would lead to... Um, would lead to low performance. Um, what we know now though, the reality of this is quite different. And what we know is that research in organizational settings indicates that work stress at any level, okay, including moderate levels, has a direct negative relationship with job performance. And it looks much more like this. So no matter how much stress you have, it's not a good thing for our work performance. And we know this from a lot of research now. One specific type of psychological consequence that is receiving a lot of attention these days is something that we call burnout. Burnout is something that you really don't want to have, and hopefully none of you guys have experienced it, but it's an extreme state of psychological strain that results from a prolonged response to chronic stressors in your job that exceed a person's resources to cope. So this is someone who's been dealing with job stressors, um, the same type of stressors at work, and it's just continuing and it totally taxes you. We see this a lot in the healthcare professions. Um, unfortunately, if you get to this point, a simple vacation is not going to help you. Um, there are three aspects of burnout that typify um, burnout. Um, one aspect is called emotional exhaustion, and this is when the employee reports that they're just completely drained and emotionally drained by work. The next aspect that they report feeling is depersonalized. So these people are kind of hardened and they start to treat their patients or their customers like objects. And then finally, there's low personal accomplishment. When um, individuals or employees feel that they can't deal with their problems effectively um, and or identify with other people. Um, we'll also post this. This is just a funny few minute clip on um, stress in the workplace. I hope you enjoy that.